an ability and a willingness to address serious issues, discuss them openly in a serious way so that we fully understand the complexities of the issues, that there are no easy answers, and that's the best way to actually arrive at a solution. Andrew has benefited us not only with his uh, deep insight into the problems, but also suggested solutions. And I think what he finished with and said...
Labour for doing something about this is what is the last point you've been making, particularly in relation to the security aspects of life. And more does go on, but you know, the, the, the phenomenon that's, that's running right across the international boundaries in terms of cooperation, like child protection, for instance, and the secu above all the security, surely that's the real driver to that. But the politicians, the bureaucrats, whatever, really need to get this sorted. And I'm just picking up on, on, on your last comment on that. It's more a comment than a question, Paul, but uh, I think, and where my, my old law enforcement hat, I would hate that we would go back to the old days. Unworkable. It was slow to be <laughs> unworkable, you know, mm. and the EAW. Interestingly, what your comment about Poland, my understanding about Poland is that there is a lack of requests to many mm. countries because they have some kind of a non discretion. That's right, although we in the UK have introduced a sort of pro proportionality test. So we were, we were receiving an extraordinary number of requests from Poland, mm -hmm. but I mean, some of them were in relation, I think. They were stealing like, a chicken, I think. Yeah, stealing mm -hmm. a chicken, and I think somebody who ordered a. Mm. a, a the Hoover and didn't pay for it or something. You know. okay. um, but there is now a proportionality test and, and the figures are heading in the right direction yeah. in relation to Poland. Yeah. And uh, therefore, remember this too, I'm just wondering, you know, in the context of the, the, the European Court, I mean, uh, to what extent is it potentially an issue that even if there's political agreement on the way forward, that uh, I'm mindful that the first iteration of the European Economic Area Agreement fell foul of the European Court back in uh, 1992 and after being renegotiated there was concerns about the status of, uh, of European law and what you outlined in relation to Norway and Iceland. It seems to me that fundamentally within that framework is an understanding that they, if you like, case law of the European Court of Justice is going to be respected. One couldn't say that in the context of a much bigger population in relation to the UK, 65 million, uh, compared to a much smaller, about 8 million or so, uh, and also obviously a much sort of uh, potential for divergence right in the context of uh, a country that's split in terms of you know, your sceptic as against uh, Remainers. So, I mean, to what extent, even if it's a political agreement, could it potentially fall foul of the court itself? You know, even the, I'm not sure where it stands at the moment, but the joining the European uh, Convention on Human Rights has been problematic in terms of the European court itself seeing that its essential integrity and independence could be threatened by another uh, legal institution. Yes, I mean, I, if I may say so, I think you put your finger on a very good point. It's very, it's very complex, isn't it? Assuming that there was the political will to have some sort of arrangement whereby due regard or respect for the two different uh, bodies and systems of case law with the objective of ensuring as much consistency as possible, assuming that all that was politically acceptable, and given what's at stake, as we were discussing earlier, one hopes it would become politically acceptable. What you can never predict is what, 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 what the future decisions of the Court of Justice may be, which might throw all that into, into, into doubt. And of course, with, with extradition in particular, you, you are, by definition, always dealing with two ends, uh, you know, one within and one without the European <coughs> Union. Um, and, so, and so inconsistency is instantly, is instantly problematic. Um, I mean, having said all of that, uh, although it may change, I think the number of cases are growing in frequency that actually um, arrive before the European Court in relation to the European arrest warrant, well, you know, one is in danger possibly when focusing on that of, of overstating how frequent an occurrence that is, but that doesn't grapple with how the law may change. I think there's one other aspect of this, which is you know, the precedent value of what's yeah. decided on this, <coughs> this area because I think there are going to be a lot of other areas where there's going to be you know, possibly dispute resolution mechanisms needed and I think mean, both sides are going to be very reluctant to see any ground in relation to this particular issue much so they would like to resolve it because of the possible treatment value of it. On the other hand, I mean, to me it seems you know, the terrorism question is you know, the big incentive that both sides have to try and find some way out of this. But I'm sorry to say, Andrew, I think we have a solution lies in Britain accepting the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice on this issue or on the other issues. Yes, well, um, you know, just, just viewing it, just viewing it as it were as a lawyer, um, if someone came to give us some advice as to, as to the way to proceed, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be terribly difficult to come to that conclusion, would it? Um, but, uh, but we are mere lawyers. Yeah. I agree.